Hello guys, I hope you're okay. So we continue with the uh, neurophysiology classes. So we already started looking at motor system. So today we'll be discussing lecture two in motor system and in particular we'll be looking at reflexes. Okay, so I hope you are ready for the class. So uh, in that picture you can see a foolish doctor who forgot about the reflexes and then he was reminded by the patient as he was trying to examine the knee jerk reflex. So I hope you guys, you won't be like this foolish doctor who forgot about the physiology of reflexes. That's why I want you to pay attention to this class so that you are able to appreciate the reflexes and the mechanism behind the reflexes. So let's start without wasting much time. <clears throat> so in this lecture, what we're going to look at, we'll look at what is a reflex, then the reflex, reflex arc, classification of reflexes, reflex mechanism by giving typical examples of reflexes, the muscle tone, and also the general properties of reflexes. <clears throat> so this information is just too much. So depending on how we move, I may split this class into two. So we'll have the part A, where we'll discuss a reflex, a reflex arc, classification of reflexes and reflex mechanism. Then the part B of this class, we'll discuss the muscle tone and general properties of reflexes. Okay, so like I said, reflexes, <clears throat> part of the components of the reflexes are considered to be sensory and the other components are motor. You know, to say from the receptors, the sensory receptors, you have the sensory nerve fiber that is projecting to the central nervous system. Then you have the integrative center or the processing center that is located within the central nervous system. Then from there, we have the motor fibers and these motor nerve fibers are the ones that are innovating the effector organs, which could be the muscles or it could be the glands that will respond. So you have a stimulus and this stimulus will produce a particular response because the animal, the human being is going to respond. Okay, so since it's part of water system, you also need to understand levels of the motor system. So the motor system, <clears throat> has got about five major levels that I want you to understand. So the first level is involved in initiation and planning procedure of motion. So the structures that are involved in the first level, we have the prefrontal cortex, the primary motor area, the premotor cortex, and also the basal ganglia. So these structures are referred to as <clears throat> the first level of motor control. So they are involved in initiation of movement, planning of movement, and also a procedure of a motion. This is where that information is stored. Then after the first level, we have the second level. In the second level of motor function, we have the cerebellum. In this cerebellum, is involved in motion, cooperation, or coordination. Is the one that is involved in coordinating movements or motor function. That's the second level. Then from there, we have the third level. The third level contains the descending motor pathways. And these motor pathways, you're talking of the motor neurons that are descending the spinal cord, which are called the pathways or the tract, descending tracts. So these we have the pyramidal and the extra pyramidal. <clears throat> but you know to say at this third level, these descending pathways, they are starting from the motor cortex as well. And some of them, they are also coming from the premotor cortex and also the sensory areas. So all these will give rise to the descending pathways because now we're discussing the motor system. <clears throat> then from the third level where you have these pathways or motor pathways, we have the fourth level now. The fourth level is involved in spinal motion mechanisms. 
So we said at the level of the spinal cord, you have regulatory centers that are also involved in reflexes. And we say that the higher center in the midbrain is just the, the higher center in the brainstem. They contain nuclei that are just regulating the lower centers. And these lower centers are at the level of the spinal cord. So with regard to motor function, you have the fourth level where we have the spinal motion mechanisms that are involved now in regulating the actual motor neurons that are innervating the effector organs. In particular, we have the muscles and the glandular cells. Then after the fourth level, of course, we have the fifth level. So the fifth level, these are the actual motor neurons that are innervating the skeletal muscles and also the glandular cells that will give a response with regard to motor function. So these motor neurons, they are also innervating the muscle spindles. Later on, we'll discuss the muscle spindle. You realize to say that these are special sensory organs that are found within the muscle itself. So you have more like receptors or sensory receptors that are found within the muscle, are called muscle spindles. Then we also have other sensory receptors that are found within the tendons. Those are called, are called Golgi tendon organs. So you can see the units of motor neurons that are now innervating specific muscles. So these are the levels of motor function, starting from the first level all the way to the fifth level where you have the motor neuron that is going to innervate the effector organs. And then on top of that, you also have motor system hierarchy. So the hierarchy of the motor system, we have the highest level, which is called the pre-command level. So the highest level, it involves the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. So this is where you have initiation of planning of motor function. So the highest level is also called the pre-command. Basically the structures involved, like I said, is the cerebellum and the basal nuclei. So we have a lot of those nuclei that are embedded within the brain tissue, which are derivative of the diencephalon. Then we also have <clears throat> the mid level. So when you're talking about the highest level, these are involved in programs and instructions. So modified by feedback. So you have feedback mechanisms that can also modify these programs and instructions that are coming from the highest level. Then going down, we have the middle level. The middle level, this is where you have the motor cortex itself. So the motor cortex works in association with the highest or the pre-command areas where you have the storage of initiation or planning of a particular movement. So once you want to execute that movement, you need to involve the middle level. The middle level, this is the motor cortex. In the motor cortex, you have the pyramidal system. So these pyramidal system are the same descending tracks, which we said we have the pyramidal and the extra pyramidal. So those are the pyramidal system. Then we also have the brainstem nuclei that are involved in extra pyramidal. So the extra pyramidal, for instance, you have the reticular formation, the red nucleus, and the other nuclei that will give rise to the extra pyramidal tract system. Then we also have the substantia nigra, the vestibular, the red nucleus, and the other nuclei that are involved. So these structures are considered as the middle part with regard to the motor system hierarchy. Then the lowest is the spinal cord. And at the level of the spinal cord, this is where you find the reflex activity. So you can see at the level of the spinal cord, you have segmental motor controls. So these segmental motor controls are the same centers that are controlling the reflex activity. But the reflex activity will involve the sensory input that is coming from the receptors or the sensory receptors. They could be receptors associated with the skin or receptors that are found within the muscles or the receptors that are found in the tendons or the visceral organs. So these receptors, once they generate that information, it will be transmitted 
to the central nervous system and within the central nervous system that information will be processed and after processing of that information then a motor neuron will be stimulated then you're going to have a motor output that will now transmit the information to the effector to stimulate the effector cell maybe to contract if you're looking at the muscle or maybe to release certain products if you're looking at glandular cells so this is where you have the reflex activity. So in this lecture, you appreciate more. So we'll give you even typical examples of reflexes that we'll be discussing. Okay, but before we start discussing the actual reflexes and the mechanisms behind reflexes, it's very important for you to remember the nerve fiber types. So we have different nerve fiber types. So this table is not separating the sensory from the motor nerve fiber so they are just mixed here so sometimes students they get confused with this table so i'll spend just a bit of time to explain so that at least we are all on the same page <clears throat> so in this table you can see that you have the fiber type either sensory or motor then you have the function of that fiber then the diameter and the velocity the velocity of action potentials or conductivity of those action potentials so if you remember very well we said there are certain things that can affect or there are factors that can affect the conductivity of action potentials or the speed of action potentials of which one of them we discussed to say the diameter of the nerve fiber will have an effect on the conductivity of um, action potentials so the larger the diameter of the nerve fiber the greater the velocity of action potentials <clears throat> the, also the other factors that we are coming in is whether it's either the the fiber is myelinated or unmyelinated so by now you understand that myelinated nerve fibers they conduct um, action potentials at a higher speed as compared to unmyelinated because the myelinated nerve fibers, the action potentials, the way they move in myelinated, we have saltatory conductivity of action potentials, whereby the action potential appear to be jumping from one node of Lanvier to the next one. So because of that, you find that the conductivity of this action potential is very fast in myelinated. And the other thing is the diameter. <coughs> So depending on the diameter of the nerve fibers, they are grouped into different types. So you can see here, fiber types, you have type A, B, and C. So type A and B, these are myelinated. So because they are myelinated, it means even the conductivity of action potential is very fast as compared to type C. So the fastest in terms of conductivity of action potentials are type A fibers. So you find that the type A fibers, they are heavily myelinated. At the same time, they have a larger diameter. So because they are myelinated, heavily myelinated, and they have a larger diameter, you find that the velocity to which they conduct this action potential is very fast. So under type A, we also have subtypes. So you have the alpha, so A alpha, A beta, A gamma and a delta fibers so these are arranged according to the diameters so the alpha is the largest followed by the beta the gamma the delta are the smallest in terms of diameter within the a fibers so these are nerve fibers so you realize to say that the alpha the a alpha they could be sensory or they could be motor so in terms of function, they're involved in proprioception and somatomotor. So proprioception, mainly you're looking at the function of the spindle fibers and also the Golgi tendon organs that are found in tendons. So these are involved in proprioception. So you're talking of the position of the body in space and also balance. So because you want these nerve fibers sensory nerve fibers and also some of the motor nerve fibers to be heavily myelinated because 
you're talking of balance and also posture. So you need to respond very quickly. Otherwise, if they, these nerve fibers are slow to fire action potentials, you find that it will take much time for you to process that information. You find that maybe you lose your balance, you can fall and stuff like that. So God just designed it that the nerve fibers that are involved in conducting information with regard to proprioception and somatomotor, they have to be heavily marinated and with a greater diameter. So they are very fast. So they could be sensory or they could be motor. Then we have the A beta nail fibers. These are for touch and pressure. So these are just sensory in function. So you don't find motor, which are type A beta. Then the type A gamma, these are purely motor in function. So A gamma, these are just motor especially motor to the spindle fibers. So they are motor to muscle spindles. Then we also have A delta, these in terms of function, pain, cold, and touch. So they are sensory. So these are also marinated. That's why you have two different types of pain. We have fast pain and slow pain. So those sensory uh, nerve fibers that are conducting information via the A delta, these are fast because they are marinated in the diameter to some extent is big. The type B nerve fibers, these are also marinated, but they're not heavily marinated. So they are slightly marinated. So because they are slightly marinated, the diameter are smaller as compared to A fibers. So an example of B fibers, these are pre-ganglionic autonomic nerve fibers. So those nerve fibers before the ganglia within the autonomic nervous system. Remember in autonomic nervous system, you have two neurons. You have the pre-ganglionic nerve and the post-ganglionic nerve. So the pre-ganglionic nerve, that is before the ganglia, it's slightly marinated. So it's faster as compared to the post-ganglionic nerve fiber. So this is a fact that you also need to know that the autonomic nervous system, the preganglionic nerve fiber is faster in conducting electricity or action potentials as compared to the postganglionic nerve fiber. The postganglionic nerve fiber is mainly type C and these type C, they are not marinated. So they are unmarinated. So if they are unmarinated, you find that the diameter are also smaller. And in terms of conductivity of these action potential are the slowest. So because they are the slowest, even with regards to transmitting pain information, they'll be slow as compared to A delta fibers. So these are called slow pain fibers. They can also transmit information that is coming from the mechanoreceptors. So mechanoreceptors, thermal pain, all this is transmitted via the C fibers and also the post-ganglionic autonomic nerve fibers. They are classified as C. Okay, so sometimes you also have numerical classification of sensory nerve fibers. So there are, there's a difference between this table and the next one. The first table, we are just classifying nerve fibers, regardless whether they are motor or sensory. But this second table is just describing the sensory nerve fibers. So you won't find motor here. In the first table, we said the gamma motor neurons, these gamma, they are mainly just motor. So you won't find them in this other table. So let's start. So you have the number here, that's why it's called numerical classification, then the origin and the fiber type. So you have type 1A, so type 1A and 1B, these are A alpha fibers. So remember the A alpha, we said some of them, they could be motor, some of them could be sensory in function. So the ones that we are showing here are basically just sensory infarction. So you have the A alpha, these are 
sensory innervation to the muscle spindles. So you have the sensory innervation to the muscle spindles, you have type 1A, which is A alpha. Then we also have type 1B, which are also A alpha, but these they innervate the Golgi tendon organ that are found in tendons. So these two structures, these two sensory structures that are associated with the muscle, they work in collaboration. So look at how they will bring about response once there is stretching of the muscles or stretching of the tendon. Then we also have type two, the type two, they are the same as the A beta. So if you remember the A beta in this other table, we say they are responsible for touch and pressure. So they are also fast because they are myelinated. So here they are sensory only. So you can see they will come here. So you have type two, which are E, A beta, A beta. So these are sensory also to muscle spindles. So the muscle spindles are innervated by both type 1A and type 2. Then they are also responsible for touch and pressure like we saw in the other table. Then we have type 3, nerve fiber, sensory nerve fiber type 3. These are A delta. So you see that in this table, we don't have the gamma motor neurons because the gamma motor neurons these are motor they are mainly motor but here we are just having sensory so we don't have the gamma motor neurons in this table so instead of having a gamma we we skip that one we go to a delta the a delta are also classified as type 3 so these are the ones that are involved in fast pain so we have pain cord receptors and some touch receptors as well. They are also transmitting this information to the central nervous system. So they are sensory in function. Then we also have type four. These are the last ones. So these are called um, nerve fiber type C. So the type C are the same ones as type four. So these are the ones that are involved in slow pain. So they're involved in pain, temperature, and other receptors, okay? So sometimes it can be confusing, but once you understand to say in this table, you have sensory and motor grouped together here, but in this other table, it's just sensory. So for sensory, you have type 1A, 1B, which are A alpha, then you have type 2, which are A beta, then you have type 3, which are A delta, then type 4, which are mainly C fibers. We don't have B here. Remember, the B are the preganglionic autonomic nerve fibers. Okay, so we proceed. So this diagram is just showing a cross section of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord has got different structure depending at which level you are having this cross section. So in certain regions of the spinal cord you find that you have this edge-shaped gray matter these are just group of nuclei or the cell bodies of nerve fibers so these are cell bodies of neurons then where you have the white matter this is where you have marinated axons of these neurons so at the center you have this edge-shaped the edge shaped is divided into horns. So you have the dorsal horn, lateral horn, and the ventral horn. So the dorsal horn is associated with sensory information. The lateral horn, in certain portion of the spinal cord, you don't find the lateral horn, but where you have the autonomic nervous system, you will see that the edge shape will also have the lateral horn. So the lateral horn is for autonomic efferent nuclei and then the ventral horn is for somatic motor nuclei so somatic motor nuclei 
it means that in our lecture, in our lectures, we'll be discussing more of the ventral horn because it's the one that is involved in motor function. But you can see the dorsal horn here, it receives information from these sensory nerves. These sensory nerves, they have their nuclei or nucleus within the dorsal root ganglia. So from the dorsal root ganglia, this is where you find the, uh, the soma of these sensory nerve fibers. So there are special types of neurons which are called the pseudo unipolar. So you can see they are pseudo unipolar because from the soma you have just one projection that is coming from the soma, then it will bifurcate into axons. So you can see part of the axon projecting to the spinal cord to form a synapse within the dorsal horn because the dorsal horn is the one that is responsible for sensory um, information. So you have the first part of the dorsal horn, you have the somatic sensor in nuclei, then you have the inferior part of the dorsal horn is responsible for visceral sensory nuclei. So all the visceral organs, they have nerves that will project to this portion. Then from the soma or from the muscles, you also have the muscles and the joints. You also have sensory nerve fibers that are projecting to the dorsal horn. So this is for more sensory function, the lateral horn, autonomic nervous system, the ventral horn is motor function. So you have these nuclei that will form synapse. That brings us to the reflex. So what is a reflex? How can you define a reflex? So a reflex in simple terms is just a rapid involuntary motor response to a stimulus. So you need a stimulus, then the body is going to respond to that stimulus. So it's not voluntary, you don't volunteer for you to produce that response. So it's involuntary. So it's just a rapid involuntary motor response to a stimulus. The reflex is a mechanism by which sensory impulse is automatically converted into a motor effect through the involvement of the central nervous system. So you need the involvement of the central nervous system because within the central nervous system, this is where you're going to find the centers for processing that reflex information. So you have certain centers that are found at the level of the spinal cord for spinal reflexes. Then you also have centers that are associated with the brain stem or the brain itself. You have the cranial nerve reflexes. So with special senses, you discuss a lot of cranial nerve reflexes, but now in this lecture, I'll be biased towards the spinal reflexes because these are the ones that are involved in motor, the typical motor function. So for instance, you can see this baby, which is the baby blinking. So this is a blinking reflex that will involve the cranial nerves. Okay, so like I said, uh, in this lecture, I'll be biased towards spinal reflexes. Okay, so before we go in detail discussing the spinal reflexes, you should be able to understand certain terminologies. So you know to say cranial reflexes, they will involve the cranial nerves. So there'll be another lecture that will discuss a bit of cranial nerve, but I know that you've covered in anatomy to some extent. Because by now you know to say that there are 12 major cranial nerves. Of course, there are also others that are discovering uh, other cranial nerves, but the ones that are there that we're very sure are 12 ones. So you have 12 cranial nerves, of which cranial nerve number one and number two, they go direct to the cortex. So they don't enter the brain via the brainstem. Other 10 cranial nerves, they will, penetrate the, they will penetrate the brain via the brain stem. But the first two, the olfactory and the optic nerve, they go direct to the cortex. Then you know to say that you have the brain stem, which is divided into the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So the midbrain give rise to two cranial nerves, cranial nerve number three and four. Then you have the pons that will give rise 
to four cranial nerves starting from cranial nerve number five, six, seven, and eight. Then we have the medulla oblongata that will also give rise to uh, also another four cranial nerves, which are cranial nerve number nine, 10, 11, and 12. So 12 cranial nerves within the medulla oblongata, the other 12, I mean four in medulla oblongata, another four in the pons. So four plus four that gives you 10. Then the other two, they're in the midbrain. Then the other two goes direct to the cortex. So those are the olfactory and the optic cranial nerves. So within these cranial nerves, we also have cranial nerve reflexes that we might discuss when we start looking at cranial nerves. But for now, we'll dwell much on spinal reflexes. So before we go in detail discussing the spinal reflexes, there are certain terminologies that you need to employ to be able to understand. So the first one is homonymous muscle. The word homonymous, it means that this is a muscle that contains a sense organ. So remember I said muscle, they contain muscle spindle fibers. So you have spindle fibers or muscle spindle if you want. Then the tendons, they have goji tendon organs. So a muscle that contains a sense organ is called homonymous muscle. So this is called homonymous muscle. An example here are biceps. So within the biceps, you can see the muscle spindle here, which is the sensory receptor organ. Then you have synergist muscle. The synergist muscle is a muscle that produces a similar action. So if you're looking at the biceps, you have a muscle that will produce a similar action to that of a biceps. So here you have brachialis muscle. The brachialis muscle will produce the similar action to that of the biceps. So these are called synergist muscles. Then we also have antagonist muscles. Of course, you know this from anatomy. Antagonist muscle will produce the opposite function or opposite action. Okay, yeah, so in this diagram, you have these muscles. So the biceps and the brachialis muscle, these are synergist muscles. And then the antagonist are the triceps behind the bone here. Okay. So what is a reflex arc? So a reflex arc is simply just a neural pathway in which that information, the sensor information will travel and then the motor information back to the effector. So the reflex arc is simply a neural pathway or neural pathways, which is responsible for reflexes. Like we said, reflexes are rapid autonomic motor response. So you don't volunteer, they're just autonomic. So they can be visceral or somatic. So visceral associated with the visceral organ, somatic, especially the muscles and the joints or tendons and cartridge. Then we have five essential component, components of reflex arc. So there are five essential components to the reflex arc. So the five structures that you need to know should be able to discuss this. If the question comes form of an essay for you to describe components of a reflex arc, this is the information. So you have the receptor that detects the stimulus. So the stimulus will be applied to the receptor and the receptor will be able to detect the stimulus by producing the receptor potential that will initiate an action potential that will be transmitted via the sensory nerve to the processing center in the central nervous system. So from the receptor, you know, to say the next thing will be the sensory nerve fiber, which is also called the afferent. So you have the afferent or sensory neuron that transmit impulses to the central nervous system. So afferent starts with an A, A meaning approaching the central nervous system. So it's approaching or afferent. So you can't forget that. So these are sensory neurons that transmit impulses to the central nervous system. 
Then the third structure, you have the integration center that, excuse me, we have the integration center that consists of one or more synapses in the central nervous system. So the processing center in the central nervous system, it, in, it can comprise of just one synapse whereby the sensory nerve fiber is communicating with the motor nerve fiber. So you have just one synapse. Sometimes you can have more synapses in case whereby you have the interneuron, like you have those interneuron cells that are connecting the sensory and the motor. So there now you have multiple synapses or polysynapse or polysynaptic if you want. Then after the integration center, we have the efferent. So the efferent, this is the motor neuron. So the efferent starts with an E. So these are exiting the spinal cord or they are exiting the central nervous system. So that's why they're called efferent. They are conducting impulses from the integration center to an effector then the effector also start with an E. So efferent to the effector cells. Then the last component is the effector itself. That could be a muscle or a gland cell. So this muscle or a gland cell is the one that is going to respond to the efferent impulse. And these efferent impulses are motor action potentials. The motor action potentials to the efferent or the effector cell that can bring about contraction or secretion if it's a glandular cell. So these are the components of the reflex arc. So you have the receptor, the afferent or the sensory neuron, the integration center, then the efferent or motor neuron, and the effector which could be a muscle or a gland cell. So this is the same information describing the reflex, reflex arc. So within the skin here, you have free nerve endings that will function as receptors for pain or nociception. So if you have a noxious stimuli here, a stimulus at the distal end of the neuron that will inflict pain here, it will result in due stimulation of these nerve endings, free nerve endings that will function as receptors then they will generate an action potential that will be propagated via the sensory neuron towards the central nervous system for processing of that information. So the central nervous system is going to process that information and then it will be able to interpret to say, this is pain, so you need to protect the body away from it. So you find that it will send another motor information via the motor neuron. So that is after integration at the level of the spinal cord, then there'll be motor information that will stimulate the effector, in this case, a muscle, for you to be able to move away from the noxious stimulus. So this could be an example of withdrawal reflex, whereby you need to move away from a noxious stimulus or a painful stimulus, if you want. So you can see here, if by accident you put your hand on a painful object like a pin, a sharp pin, that is going to stimulate the receptors. So you have step one, where you have the arrival of the stimulus and activation of the receptor. So this receptor, the pain receptors will be activated here. Then it will send sensory information. So via the sensory nerve fiber, you have activation of this sensory neuron, then this will transmit an action potential to the central nervous system. Sometimes you can have a synapse with an interneuron. Sometimes it can form a synapse direct with a motor neuron. In this case, we have an interneuron. So this is the integration center. So the integration center is going now to activate the motor neuron. And this motor neuron is now going to transmit a motor information to the effector. So you can see after information processing the central nervous system, then via the motor neuron, 
after activation of this motor neuron in the ventral root, it will now innervate the muscles that will bring about contraction of the muscles for you to be able to move away from that painful stimulus. The neurotransmitters, you know them by now. You know to say there's vis of acetylcholine, which is stimulatory in function. So you have, you have stimulation here, then it will end up into stimulating of this nerve fiber that will also release acetylcholine to cause this muscle to contract. And you know to say there is also release of acetylcholine here. That acetylcholine goes to bind to nicotinic receptors, which are also called cholinergic receptors, and it will bring about motor input potential, and the motor input potential will bring about depolarizing the sarcolemma to the threshold, and then to fire an action potential. And that action potential will be moving at the level of the sarcomere and into the T system, where you're going to find the dihydropredine receptors and those dihydropredine receptors are sensitive to the action potentials. So they are going to open the around receptors that are found within the endoplasmic reticulum. You know, to say in skeletal muscle cells, the dihydropredine receptors are mechanically connected to the around receptors. So if they are changing in shape due to that action potential that is moving into the sarcotubular system, you know, to say that the dihydropredine receptors will stimulate the opening of rhinodine receptors and calcium will move from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. And that calcium will go and bind troponin C and the tropomyosin will move away from the actin, exposing the binding site on actin. So once the binding site on actin has been exposed, mousin is able to bind to those actin and it will bring about a power stroke that will result into shortening of the sarcomere, and then you have contraction of a particular muscle, and then you are able to cause flexion of maybe the hand so that you move away from the painful stimulus. So this is a reflex act, coupled with the contraction of the muscles. <clears throat> so this is basically what I was trying to explain here, that you have the sense organ, which is a receptor, then once you introduce the stimulus to the receptor, it's going to produce a generator potential. And this generator potential is going to end up stimulating the afferent neuron that will fire action potentials to the integration center at the level of the spinal cord. Then you have end, then you have these excitatory postsynaptic potentials, the excitatory postsynaptic potentials will stimulate the motor neuron that will fire another action potential. So via the efferent neuron that is diverting the muscle fiber, where you have the neuromuscular junction, this is where you find the release of acetylcholine that will bring about end rate potentials and action potentials in the muscles, and that will bring about contractility of the muscle. So this is called the reflex or the pathway of the reflex. Okay, so we have different types of reflexes. So let's look at classification of reflexes. So reflexes are classified based on clinical, anatomical, number of synapses, conditional or unconditional reflexes, and then the functional classification of reflexes. So these are types of classifications. So sometimes I can bring a question to say, can you discuss classifications of reflexes based on clinical. So under clinical, you have superficial reflexes, you have deep reflexes, then you can also have pathological reflexes. Then under anatomical, you're looking at the anatomy of the spinal cord. So you have segmental reflexes, the intersegmental or suprasegmental reflexes. Then a number of synapses at the level of the spinal cord again, you can have a synaptic. A synaptic, it means without a synapse. So the, a synaptic is also called axon reflex. So it doesn't involve any synapse. But you can have monosynaptic if you have one synapse. You can have disynaptic or polysynaptic. That is class, classification of 
reflexes based on number of synapses. Then you can also have classification based on whether it's conditional or unconditional. So conditional reflexes are uh, reflexes that somebody is not born with. And conditional reflexes, you are born with them. For instance, sense of smell. Every person, a normal person is born with a sense of smell. So you're able to smell nice food. And then test all those reflexes, you are born with them. So they are called unconditional, but sometimes they are conditional reflexes. I'll explain later on. Then we also have functional classifications based on the function of the reflex, whether it's a, a flexor reflex or extensor reflex. Does it cause friction or does it cause extension of joints? So that is based on function. So this table is basically the same as the one that I was just explained. So these are classification of reflexes. So you have the clinical classifications where you have superficial depending on the location of the receptors. So you have superficial receptors that are associated with the skin. So those are called superficial reflexes. You have deep receptors that are found deep into the muscle, the tendons. So those are called deep um, reflexes. Then we have visceral reflexes associated with the visceral organs, pathological reflexes, for instance, the Babinski reflex, if it's, if it's there, if it's positive, then it means it's pathological, otherwise you're not supposed to have the Babinski reflex, which is also called the plantar reflex. So those are pathological. Then we have anatomical classification, we're looking at the segment or the spinal cord. Is it within the same segment, which is called segmental reflexes, or is it moving to the other segment, the pathway, and then it's called the intersegmental, or is it going upwards, which is called the suprasegmental? So we don't have the infrasegmental, mainly it's the suprasegmental, whereby it moves into the segment and then the pathway moves into the the segment above. So it's called the suprasegmental reflexes. Then classification based on the number of synapses, we have a synaptic. An example, we have axonal reflex that doesn't involve any synapse. So you find that you from the sensory receptor, the axon can branch off and stimulate the effector cells. So those is called axonal reflexes they don't involve any synapse or any processing center. So they are not true reflexes because they don't have a processing center or the integrating center. Then you have the monosynaptic where you just have a, mono means one, so one synapse. That's why it's called monosynaptic. By synapse, by synaptic, it means there are two synapses. Then polysynaptics, these are more than two. So you have, polysynaptic reflexes. According to functional classifications, functional classifications. So functional classification, we have the flexor reflex, extensor, writing reflex, postural reflex, or withdrawal reflex. Then you can also have unconditioned or conditioned reflex. So let's just add some more information to these classifications starting with the clinical classification. So the clinical classification of reflexes. Okay, this, so we said we can have superficial or deep reflexes or pathological under clinical classifications. So the clinical classification, the superficial, it means it's initiated by stimulating appropriate receptors of the skin or mucous membrane. So these are superficial receptors. So associated with the skin or the mucous membrane. So once you stimulate those receptors, it can bring about a reflex. So these are called superficial reflexes. <clears throat> so these superficial reflexes are usually multisynaptic, meaning that in other way, they are polysynaptic. So they have more than two synapses. That's why they're called multisynaptic. Then they are also usually involving moving away from a stimulus, like a withdrawal reflex. So e.g. withdrawal reflex or a plantar response. So this plantar response or 
Babinski response is whereby you stimulate the receptors on the skin, on the skull. So on the soil, the foot. So the soil, the foot, when you stimulate those receptors under there, you can have a positive or a negative Babinski response. Then another example is the corneal or conjunctival reflexes. So they are shown here. One on top here, this is the plantar response or the Babinski. Then down here, you can have conjunctiva or the corneal reflex. The corneal reflex, just using fine cotton, if you touch the cornea, then that's the corneal reflex. If you touch part of the conjunctiva, then that will give you a conjunctival reflex. So these are blinking reflexes. When you touch with a, with a cotton, you're supposed to blink. So those are reflexes. So introduce a stimulus, you know the response. So if the response is not there, then you will know which part of the pathway is damaged. So these reflexes, they are very important with regards to neurological examination of patients. So sometimes, you know, to say if you apply this stimulus, you're supposed to get a stereotype response. So the responses are stereotyped. So it means that you will know to say if you introduce this stimulus, you're supposed to get a, a certain response. So if you're not getting that certain response, it will give you an idea which part of the reflex arc is maybe damaged or traumatized or inflamed or maybe there is sclerosis taking place there, or it's in neurodegenerative diseases, so you'll be able to tell which part of the reflex. Okay, so under clinical, so we had the, the superficial reflexes, and then we also have the deep reflexes. So these deep reflexes, they're also called tendon reflexes or muscle spindle reflexes. So stimulating receptors deep in muscles, are basically stretch re reflexes. So the deep reflexes are also called the stretch reflexes because once you stretch a muscle, you're going to stimulate the muscle spindles that will bring about contractility of the muscle or the muscle is going to contract in response to stretching. So it's a protective reflex. You don't want to overstretch the muscles. Otherwise, if the muscles are overstretched, they can tear. So to avoid that or to prevent that, you find that when you stretch the muscle, it's going to respond by contracting because within the muscles, you have the spindle fibers or spindle muscles that are responding to stretching. Then they'll produce or they'll initiate a, a sensory information that will stimulate the motor function or the motor neurons that are innervating the muscles. So these are alpha motor neurons that we intend to stimulate the muscles to contract. So are also called tendon reflexes because of the Golgi tendon organs that are found within the tendons. So an example is the knee jerk or ankle jerk. So you are stimulating the spindle fibers or the Golgi tendon organs that are found in the muscles and the tendons, respectively. So you can see here the knee jerk reflex. If you're using the patella hammer, and then you hit the patella ligament here. You're going to stretch the quadriceps muscles. So within the quadriceps muscles, this is where you find the spindle fibers. So they're going to they are going to be stretched and then they'll send the sensory information to the spinal cord. Then you have motor information to the same muscle that will bring about contraction of the muscle because as you are hitting the patella ligament here, you find that there is stretching of this muscle. So the muscle will protect itself by contracting so that it doesn't overstretch. So it's more of a protective reflex. Then at the same time, we find that there's inhibition of contraction of the hamstring muscles because these are antagonist muscles to the quadriceps. So never mind, we'll still discuss that. So we're going to have a lab and we'll do these reflexes. So even if you don't understand here, there's still time for you to have the hands-on experience in the lab. So we'll do this. So you can see some of the examples of deep, deep tendon reflexes. 
So you have a bicep reflex here. So you have the bicep reflex whereby you, you apply force on the bicep tendon. Then once it's stretched, you find that if you hit with the patella hammer here, you're going to overstretch the bicep tendon. That will result in two contraction of the biceps. So you know to say once you stretch the biceps, you need to have contraction of the biceps because within the biceps you have the spindle fibers. When you stretch them, they are going to send sensory information to the spinal cord. Then from the spinal cord, the integrative center, they are going to send motor information to the muscles to contract. So you expect that you need to have a contraction. So by so doing, you are also looking at the nerve innervation to this, um, the biceps and also the level of the spinal cord. So which level of the spinal cord? Mainly when it's the biceps is C5, C6. So we'll also do that in the lab. C5, C6, that's the level you are testing. If you are doing a biceps reflex, then you can also have the brachioradialis reflex. The brachioradialis reflex, you are also testing for C5, C6 level, the spinal cord. So once you stretch the brachioradialis tendon, you find that the, the muscle is supposed to contract. Then down here, you have the knee jerk. So if you, if you hit the patella ligament here, you will find that you're going to have a knee jerk because you have contraction of the quadriceps that are going to pull on the lower extremity. So you find that you're going to have a knee jerk. Then you have the ankle, ankle reflex here, the ankle reflex, or when you hit the Achilles tendon or the, the, of the calf muscles here, when you hit here, you find that you're going to have a movement. You're going to have the contraction of the calf muscles. That will result into the knee jerk. So for the biceps and the brachioradialis reflex, you are testing for C5, C6 level of the spinal root. The knee jerk is S1, S2. The ankle jerk, you are mainly looking at L2, 3, and 4. So you'll be able to tell which level the spinal cord. If you don't get a response, then you are also able to localize which part of the spinal cord is damaged if you don't get a response. So this is just a table summarizing what I was discussing with you guys. So it's nothing complicated here. These are just simple things. So you have the deep tendon reflex, the reflexes, different deep tendon reflexes. So you have the biceps, triceps, pectoris, pectoralis, and then brachioradialis, and then the finger extends flexors, and then the knee, the abductor, the ankle, and the plantar. The muscle involved, the nerve supply to that muscle, then the root supply, or the nerve root that is supplying that muscle at the level of the spinal cord. So starting with the biceps, the muscle involved are the biceps muscles. The nerve supply is the musculocutaneous nerve. The nerve root or the root supply C5, C6. So if you are checking for biceps and then you don't have a response, just not to say that you have damage maybe to the C5, C6, or damage to the musculocutaneous nerve. Then if you're testing for triceps, the muscle involved are triceps themselves, the nerve supply, the radial nerve, then the nerve root C6, C7, and C8. Six, seven, and eight. These are the triceps. Then pectoralis reflex, you're looking at pectoralis major muscle in the chest. Then 
the nerve supply is the pectoral nerve. The root supply is a C, six, seven, eight, just the same as the triceps. So the same level there. Then brachioradialis reflex. The muscle involved is the brachioradialis muscle. Then the nerve supply is the radio nerve, you know that. Then the root supply is C5, C6. The finger flexors, so you have the flexor digitolum. So this flexor digitolum is a muscle. It's innervated by the medial and the ulnar nerve. The level you're checking for, C7, 8, and T1. The knee jerk, you have quadriceps femoris muscles, the femoral nerve, that's the nerve supply, which level the spinal cord, L2, 3, and 4. Abductor muscles, you're looking at, I mean, uh, adductor reflex, you're looking at adductor muscles, then the nerve supply to the adductor muscles, you have obturator nerve. Level the spinal cord, L2, 3, and 4. Ankle reflex, psoriasis muscle and gastrocnemius muscle. Innervation, sciatic and tibial nerve. The nerve root or the level of the spinal cord is S1, S2. Then the plantar, these are small foot muscles you're looking at. The nerve supply is the plantar nerve. And the root supply, when you're checking for plantar, this is the same as Babinski, mainly you're looking at the corticospinal tract. So if you have damaged corticospinal tract or injury, which can be due to maybe stroke or any other factor, trauma, you have damage to the corticospinal tract, you're going to have a positive Babinski sign. And you need to know that in babies, you can have a positive Babinski, especially newborn babies up to the age of 12 months. Sometimes it can persist to 24 months, but on average, 12 months. Find that you can have a positive Babinski sign. Why? It's because in babies, they are still developing the corticospinal tract. So the corticospinal tract in babies is underdeveloped. Because of that, they can, they can give you a positive Babinski. It doesn't mean that their corticospinal tract are damaged. It's just that they are still developing. Okay, moving on to visceral reflexes. So visceral reflexes, uh, the reflexes where at least one part of the reflex arc is autonomic nerve, stimulating receptors in viscera. So these, uh, once you stimulate the receptors in viscera, you can have the visceral reflexes, e.g. papillary reflex. When you introduce a light in the eye, a beam of light, you find that the pupil starts decreasing in diameter. Okay, so that's called pupillary reflex. Then you have the carotid sinus reflex. So you can see down here you have the papillary reflex. Once you introduce a light, you need to, to see that the diameter of the pupil will reduce because you have contraction of those iris muscles and also ciliated body or ciliated muscles. And then on top here, you have the carotid sinus reflex. So within the carotid sinus, if you massage the carotid sinus, you have baroreceptors there that are going to interpret that information as an increase in blood pressure, and that can result into inhibition of the heart rate. So you find that the, the heart rate will reduce once you have massage of the carotid sinus, because that information <coughs> will be interpreted as an increase in blood pressure. And you know to say blood pressure, the regulatory mechanisms that are involved there, they involve the baroreceptors so via the grossopharyngeal nerve and also the vagus nerve when you're looking at the aortic arc. So you have those baroreceptors in the carotid sinus via the grossopharyngeal nerve, it will, 
transmit action potentials to the medulla oblongata. In the medulla oblongata, that's where you find the nucleus of tractus solitarius that can stimulate or inhibit certain centers. And those centers are cardiac centers. So you have two cardiac centers in the medulla oblongata. We have the cardio acceleratory center and the cardio inhibitory center. So in this case, because of an increase in the firing of action potentials from the baroreceptors via the sensory neurons in the cranial nerve number nine, the grossopharyngeal. So you find that the nucleus of tractus solitarius, it will interpret that information to say that there is an increase in blood pressure. So it will initiate mechanisms that will decrease the blood pressure. So how is it going to do that? It's going to stimulate the cardio inhibitory center, which are the parasympathetics, then it's going to inhibit the cardio accelerator center, which are the sympathetics. So the parasympathetics are going to be stimulated. That will result into production of acetylcholine. The postganglionic nerve is going to release acetylcholine to the AC node and to the AV node. And you know to say that acetylcholine has got negative inotropic, chronotropic, and dromotropic effect on the heart. So the heart rate is going to reduce, the conductivity of action potential is going to reduce, and the contractility of the myocardium is also going to decrease. And that will result into a decrease in stroke volume and decrease in cardiac output, because you know to say cardiac output is a product of stroke volume and the heart rate. So if the heart rate are reducing, the contractility is also reducing, you find that the cardiac output is going to decrease. And with a decrease in cardiac output, the blood pressure will start decreasing. So that is called a carotid sinus reflex. So if you massage there, you expect that the heart rate is supposed to decrease and the contractility of the myocardium is also supposed to decrease. <clears throat> okay. Then the pathological classification, we're still under clinical classifications. Pathological classifications, so are not found normally. Presence indicates pathological condition within the body. An example is Babinski sign. So this is another name for plantar reflex. So if there's positive Babinski, then it means there's a pathology with regards to the corticospinal tract. So if you have damage to the corticospinal tract, you're going to get a positive Babinski. So the normal one, once you stimulate those receptors on the sole of the foot, you're supposed to move away from the stimulus. So you can see that the foot is trying to move away from the stimulus. This is the normal one. But the positive Babinski sign is where you have the dose of friction of the big toe and the other toes, the smaller toes, they're going to fan out. So once they fan out and then you have the dose of friction of the big toe, that is a positive Babinski sign that will indicate damage to the corticospinal tract. And also in babies, it can be positive because you have undeveloped corticospinal tract. So these are called pathological reflexes. If they are there, then it means there's a pathology developing in the body. Then anatomical classifications. So depending on the segments on the spinal cord, we have segmental reflexes. These segmental reflexes, in this, in this the end of afferent neuron and the beginning of the efferent neuron are in the same segment of the spinal cord. So they're just in the same segment. That's why it's called segmental reflex. So the reflex arc pass through one anatomical segment of the spinal cord. An example is the knee jerk reflex. So the knee jerk, you realize to say that the, the reflex arc actually just passes one segment of the spinal cord. So this is the segment I'm talking about. So you can see this is the segment. The other segment is on the other side. So the knee jerk, the sensory information and the motor information is within the same segment at the level of the spinal cord. So this is called segmental reflexes. Okay, and then you can have inter-segmental reflexes. So end of the afferent neuron, the beginning of the efferent neuron are in the spinal cord, but in different segments. That's why it's called inter-segmental. 
So it will move to the other segment, but at the same level, the spinal cord, but just in two different segments. It involves more than one segment. An example is crossed extensor response. So the cross extens extensor response. So you can see here that the sensory neuron from the receptors here is penetrating the spinal cord, but some of the information is going to the other segment. So it's crossing the segment here. That's why it's called the intersegmental reflexes. So an example is the crossed extensor reflex. So the reflex occur when you step on a sharp object, there is a rapid lifting of the affected foot. So this is its lateral withdrawal reflex. So you can see if you step on a sharp object, there is a rapid lifting of the affected foot, which is its lateral. So you can see here, it's its lateral because on the same side where you are having a stimulus, this is where you're lifting the foot. So you have the, the lifting of the foot or you have flexion of the foot. Why? You have these extensor muscles that will be inhibited, but the flexor muscles on that same foot will be stimulated so that you're able to lift your foot. But because of that, there is another information that will be sent to the other, to the other foot that will result into contraction of the extensor muscles. So the extensor muscles on the other leg will be stimulated. The flexor muscles will be inhibited on the other leg so that you are able to support your weight with one leg. So the information is moving to the other segment. That's why it's called the cross extensor reflex. So while the contralateral response activates the extensor muscles of the opposite leg. So you can see the extensor muscles are stimulated here to extend the leg so that you're able to support yourself as you are lifting the other leg. So this is called the cross extensor reflex. Okay. Then classification based on the number of synapses. So you have monosynaptic, which simply mean just have one synapse. So you have sensory neuron communicating with the motor neuron. So the sensory neuron comes in and directly synapses on the motor neuron. So you can see the sensory nerve or neuron forming a synapse with the motor neuron that is innervating the muscles. So this is very fast. That's why it's called monosynaptic. An example is the stretch reflex. Then the bisynaptic. It reflexes, so you have two synapses. So it requires that one interneuron be interposed between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. So you can see the sensory neuron forming a synapse with the interneuron, and the interneuron is the one communicating with the motor neuron. So the interneuron will function as the processing center or the integratory center. An example is the reciprocal innovation, this precoal innovation of antagonistic muscles. Then polysynaptic, it's more than two synapses. So it has more than two synapses in the spinal cord. So you have the sensory nerve or neuron from the receptors communicating with the interneuron. This interneuron is communicating with another interneuron and that interneuron is the one communicating with the motor neuron. So you have more than two synapses. So this is called polysynaptic. An example is superficial reflex, like withdrawal reflex as well. Okay, so this is an, exam an example of monosynaptic reflex, it's a stretch reflex or the sensory stretch reflex. So you can see when once you hit the patella ligament, you have stretching of the spindle fibers that will send sensory information, just one synapse with the motor neuron, then to cause contraction of that muscle. So this is just one synapse, monosynaptic. Then the polysynaptic, it could be more than two, but in this diagram it's not really accurate because this is 
by synaptic because you only have two synapses. So it's not necessarily a polysynaptic, this one is by synaptic. So examples of monosynaptic, stretch reflex, by or disynaptic, Golgi tendon reflex, polysynaptic withdrawal reflex. <coughs> okay, then classification of reflexes based on physiological classification. So this is physiological classification. You have physiological classification or the functional, the function of that reflex. So you have flexor reflexes, the flexor reflexes, they are produced when nociceptive stimulus is applied. So stimulus causes friction of the joint. For instance, a thorn prick to a sore causes friction of the knee and also the hip joints. <clears throat> extensor reflexes, once you have a stimulus to bring about extension of the joints. So these reflexes cause extension of the joints. Stretch reflexes are extensor reflexes, which are the basis of the tone in posture. Okay, so you have the other components of the stretch reflexes. So we're just talking of the stretch reflexes, which is the same. So you're going to stimulate that muscle and then you're going to inhibit the antagonist. So there is excitation of synergist. So the synergist will also be stimulated together with the biceps in this case. Then the triceps, which are antagonists, they'll be inhibited. So you can see that the synergist, these are monosynaptic. Then the antagonist muscle or the reciprocal innervation is bisynaptic. So this is going to be inhibited. That's why it requires an interneuron that is inhibitory in nature, that is going to inhibit the alpha motor neuron innervating the antagonistic muscle so that you only have stimulation of a pair of muscles that will have a similar function or action. And that, that opposes that action will be inhibited. Then we also have the inverse stretch reflex. So the inverse stretch reflex is the opposite of the stretch reflex. Remember, the stretch reflex we said, once you stretch the muscle by pulling the tendons or applying force on the tendons or pulling the muscle itself, it will result into stimulating the spindle fibers that will, that will now generate an action potential via the sensory nerve. It will go to the spinal cord. Then with these synapses with the motor neurons, they will be stimulated. Then the motor neurons will cause contraction of that muscle that was stretched and also contraction of the synergist muscle. So this is called the stretch reflex. When you stretch, it will contract. Then you have the opposite of this, which is called the inverse stretch reflex. So I want you to understand the inverse stretch reflex. So the inverse stretch reflex, I will explain from the diagram, but this, the inverse mainly involves the Golgi tendon organs. The stretch reflex involves the spindle fibers. The inverse stretch reflex involves the Golgi tendon organ of the agonist muscle. So I'll explain from the diagram for you to understand. So this is the inverse stretch reflex. So what you need to understand is that when you stretch a muscle, we say it's going to contract. So in this case, the quadriceps extensor muscles, once you hit the patella ligament here, this tendon will be stretched and it's going to stretch the muscle once the muscle is stretched, it's going to stimulate the speed of fibers that will fire a sensory new um, action potentials to the spinal cord. And then from the spinal cord, motor information back to the effector muscle for the quadriceps to contract. That is the stretch reflex. So as these quadriceps are contracting, it means that they are also pulling on the tendons. So this is where the inverse starts from. So when the quadriceps in this case, they are contracting, they are going to pull the tendons. As the tendons are being pulled, they are going to stimulate the Golgi tendon organ in the tendons. So the Golgi tendon organs will be stimulated now. So they will fire action potential. This is sensory information. 
So this nerve fiber, the sensor nerve fiber is going to fire an action potential because the Golgi tendon sensor receptor has been stimulated by the contraction of the quadriceps that are pulling on the tendon. That action potential will be transmitted to the spinal cord. So in the spinal cord, you have these interneurons. So it's going to stimulate the interneuron that is innervating the antagonist muscle. In this case, we have the hamstring flexor muscles. So it's going to stimulate the hamstring to contract, producing the opposite action. And then it's going to inhibit the flexor muscle, the quadriceps. So the interneuron that is supposed to stimulate the motor neuron that is innervating the quadriceps is going to be inhibited. So once it's inhibited, it means that the quadriceps now are going to relax, but the flexor muscles are going to contract. So this is a mechanism that is going to prevent this muscle to over pull the tendon to the extent that the tendon can snap. Because if the muscle is over contracting, it will it will exert a stronger pull on the tendon that can result into snapping on the tendon. So to prevent that, this muscle that is contracting is going to be inhibited. So it's going to relax. And then the antagonist muscle is going to contract and that is going to protect. So you'll find that the spindle fibers and the Golgi tendon organs, they are there to protect the muscle so that it doesn't tear and the tendons, they don't snap from the attachment. So this is how just got created. So this, this one is called the inverse stretch reflex. It's the opposite of the stretch reflex. Okay, then classification depending upon inborn or acquired reflexes. This is the last classification. So unconditioned reflexes. So unconditioned reflexes, you are born with them. So these are inborn reflexes, for instance, the smell of food is an unconditioned reflex, so it's unconditioned reflex. A feeling of hunger in response to the smell is unconditioned reflex. So if maybe your neighbor is cooking very nice, delicious meal, and there's just good smell coming from there, that is going to initiate a reflex in you, then you feel hunger. Okay, then yeah, so this is an inborn reflex. So they are called unconditioned. They are already there. Then there are conditioned reflexes, which you are not born with, but they can develop with certain stimulus. So these are reflexes that develop after birth. So you're not born with them. So the sound of a whistle is the conditioned stimulus. So the conditioned response will be feeling hungry when you held the sound of the whistle. So for instance, there is a just a simple illustration or experiment. For instance, you have the neutral stimulus like the bell or a silent. If you ring the bell, then you don't get any response from this dog because there's nothing associated with this bell. But now if you introduce something else in between the neutral stimulus, and you are using, you are taking advantage of the inborn or the unconditioned reflex. You know to say, a smell of nice food can initiate unconditioned reflex in the dog. So before giving the dog the food, first you ring the bell. So every time you want to give this dog food, first you ring a bell, then you give the food. Next time you ring a bell, then you give the food. You find that with time this dog will be conditioned to the bell to the extent that the next time you're going to ring the bell even if you don't have the food that you're going to give this dog this dog is going to salivate so this is a conditioned reflex that can develop after birth it wasn't there but now you have conditioned it so these are called conditioned reflexes and there are also other reflexes like you have also other reflexes. For instance, you have the tonic neck 
reflex of the baby. So you just have a tone in the muscles of the neck. So there's contractility in the neck muscles. So this is called tonic neck reflex, grasp reflex. If you put your finger in the palm of the baby, the baby is going to grasp your, your finger or it's going to grab the finger. So this is the grasp reflex that helps the baby to hold things, to hold maybe the breast during breastfeeding because you have that reflex. Then you have the stepping reflex. The baby, if you're trying to put the baby on the couch, for instance, or down, the baby will start now assuming that uh, walking movements as if the baby is trying to walk when you hold the baby like that. So this is called a stepping reflex. If you're bringing the baby down, you find that the baby is going to extend the leg. So this is called a stepping reflex. Then also the baby can crawl down. When you put the baby down, it will try to crawl. So that's called a crawl reflex. <clears throat> so walking reflex and stepping reflex. I think I've already explained this. So when the sole of the foot is pressed against the couch, the baby tries to walk. So that's a walking reflex. So legs sprouts up and down as if the baby is walking or dancing. So present at birth disappears at approximately two to four months. With daily practice of reflex, infants may walk alone at 10 months. So if you practice this, you find that the baby is able to walk at 10 months, which is a good thing. Other reflexes that we won't discuss much, for instance, you have the aroma of your favorite food is that salivating. So there's kind of food when you just smell the aroma of that food and then you just start salivating. So these are inborn or unconditioned reflexes. Then a nasty odor or a bad smell of rotten food, for instance, then you have nausea, you feel like vomiting. That's a reflex. A bright light shining in your eyes, pupils it get smaller. So there's constriction of the pupil. So it will get smaller when there's a bright light. An insect flying towards your eye, then blinking. You will blink because you don't want this insect to get into your eyes. So these are just other reflexes. Then we have chewing reflex. You're chewing, you know, when you're initiating it, it's voluntary, but with time it becomes a reflex. So that reflex is called chewing reflex, which we discussed in GIT. So for instance, if you have a bolus of food in the mouth, if you introduce a bolus of food in the mouth or you introduce food in the mouth as you are chewing a bolus of foam. So this bolus will initiate reflex inhibition of the muscles of mastication. So there are sensory receptors that are going to be stimulated then those are going to inhibit muscles of mastication that will allow the lower jaw to drop. As you are dropping the lower jaw, you're going to initiate a stretch reflex because you know, we said once the muscles are stretched, they are going to contract. So you know to say, as you are lowering the jaw or as you are dropping the jaw, that is going to initiate a stretch reflex of the jaw muscles, then that will result into a rebound contraction. So it's going to contract. Then automatically raises the jaw to cause closure of the teeth plus compression of the bolus against the lining of the mouth that will also inhibit again the mass of mastication and then you're going to drop. So it becomes a reflex. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. So you have uh, sensory receptors within the, the oral cavity. So when you put your food there, it's going to send sensory information to the chewing centers. So within the chewing centers, they are going to stimulate certain muscles that can help to drop the lower jaw. Then it's going to inhibit the muscles of mastication. So once the muscles of mastication are inhibited, the lower jaw is going to drop. As you're dropping the lower jaw, these muscles of mastication will be stretched. As they are stretched, stretch receptors will be stimulated. That will send sensor information, then back again, motor information to cause contraction. Once you have contraction of 
of muscles of mastication, then you're going to close the mouth. As you are closing, you are chewing here, then the sensory receptors will be stimulated again. They're going to inhibit the muscles of mastication is going to drop. So it becomes a reflex, which is called a chewing reflex. Then <clears throat> the last part of this lecture, before we go to part two of the lecture, we'll just discuss the reflex mechanism, a typical examples of reflexes. So to some extent, we've already discussed this, so I'll be very fast. So a typical reflex, you have the sensory neuron, the interneuron, which is the integrated center, and then the motor neuron, and then you have the effector. So you have a stimulus. So the reflex testing is a powerful clinical tool when, with regard to neurological examination of the patients that are exhibiting clinical signs or neurological clinical signs. So you want to test which level is affected with the spinal cord. For instance, after trauma, maybe there is damage to the spinal cord and then you want to know which level the spinal cord is affected. So you can do these spinal reflexes. So you know the stimulus that you're going to apply to the receptors and you know the stereotype response that you're supposed to get. So if you put your stimulus, you don't get a response, then you'll be able to diagnose which part of the spinal cord. So in clinical tests, so in clinical test, apply stimulus one and see if you can get response two. If absent, diagnose where the pathway is interrupted. If abnormal, diagnose where pathway is compromised. So sometimes we can have exaggerated reflexes or you can have reflexes that are, are compromised. For instance, the intensity of the reflex maybe it's reducing. So you need to know which part of the spinal cord or in the reflex axis where you have damage or compromise. Okay. Spindle fibers and goji tendon organs. So the spindle fibers and goji tendon organs, we'll discuss them in part two of this lecture. Otherwise, it will be a, a long video that will be so boring. So for this part A of lecture two, I'm going to end here. Then the last part will discuss the spindle fibers and goji tendon. Then we're also going to discuss uh, properties of reflexes, the general properties of reflexes. So this is where I end.